Hi there, this is Herb Schreiber with the Dr. Vax channel. And today we're going to talk about a very controversial topic. No, we're not going to be covering politics. No, we're not going to talk about your favorite Netflix video. Instead, we're going to talk about whether you should purchase a 3D printer from Prusa. About two and a half years ago, I purchased my first 3D printer. It was a Prusa i3 MK3. Since then, I've added 10 other models of 3D printers to the Dr. Vax lab. And for a long time, my Prusa sat on a shelf unused. Often the most recent printer I acquired was my favorite for a while. Now there are some printers I go back to over and over again, and we're going to talk about that a bit today. But recently I had the opportunity to spend about three months using my Prusa i3 MK3 extensively. And it's a great printer. So we're going to talk about today whether you should buy a Prusa 3D printer. Stay tuned and let's learn something together. Over the past two and a half years, I've produced over 150 videos on this channel covering a range of topics from 3D printing, a little bit of electronics, a little bit of programming, a little bit of woodworking. Now, if you enjoy this channel, then the best way you could help me out is subscribing. Subscribing to a YouTube channel is completely free, but it sort of tickles the Google YouTube algorithm. And what that means is when I have a lot of subscribers, YouTube will be more likely to show more of my videos. So it helps me out. So please subscribe, click on the bell to be notified about my up and coming videos. Before we talk specifically about Prusa printers, I wanna cover two topics to make sure we have a complete understanding of some of the factors that will influence whether a Prusa printer is right for you. So let's look at the screen together. On this page, you'll see a simple diagram that should help you understand more about the 3D printing ecosystem. Now, today specifically, we're talking about FDM 3D printers. Those are 3D printers that use a filament. The filament could be a variety of different diameters. The printers I use are typically 1.75 millimeter diameter filament printers, but there are others that use three millimeters and there might be some other variants out there. And these printers melt that filament and extrude it in a line along a platform, much like a hot glue gun. Now the physical components consist of the mechanical construction. The stiffer your 3D printer, the more likely it will produce consistent results. It includes the stepper motors, the various motors that move the print head backward, side to side, and up and down. It includes the extruder that takes the filament from the reel and pushes it into the hot end where it's melted and extruded. That's the hardware. The quality of the hardware matters. Next, we have the firmware. The firmware is responsible for accepting a file of instructions, often in G-code format. And these instructions inform the hardware, control the hardware, so it can properly extrude the filament. Firmware is just a computer science and electrical engineering term for software that's embedded in a device. You have firmware in your automobile today. You have firmware in your refrigerator. You have firmware perhaps in your watch. I have firmware in my watch. 
So firmware is just software that's often embedded in a piece of equipment. Then you have a slicer. A slicer takes a model of an object, a three-dimensional object, that could be in a variety of different formats and puts it in the format appropriate for your 3D printer. It then saves it on an SD card or transmits it over Wi-Fi or a cable to your 3D printer. The firmware consumes those instructions, interprets those instructions, and drives the hardware. The mechanism that takes the filament off of a reel, drives it to the hot end where it's melted and extruded, is often generically referred to as the extruder. But the extruder is just the component. And actually, if you watch a couple of my early videos, I often got this wrong. The extruder is really just the component that pulls the filament off the reel and pushes it into the hot end. The business end of a 3D printer is the hot end where the filament is melted. Let's look at this diagram together. On the left side, we have a Bowdoin style 3D printer. Most Creality printers are Bowdoin style. In fact, most low end printers are Bowdoin style with more direct extruder style printers coming to the marketplace. I'll explain why in a moment. In a Bowdoin style 3D printer, which you'll see in this diagram, the extruder is often connected somewhere on the frame of the printer. It pulls the filament off of the reel. It feeds it through a tube. That tube is called a Bowdoin tube. That tube then goes into the hot end, and in the hot end, the filament is melted and extruded onto the print platform. Now, that, that tube is flexible. That tube may or may not be very precisely manufactured. The filament moves around in that tube. So the extrusion is not potentially as precise because you have that extra component. In a direct extruder, the extruder is sitting right on top of the hot end. We'll see that on the right-hand side. And yes, there may be a tube that's just used to direct the filament, but from the point where the filament is pulled and pushed into the hot end, there's very little space. The hot ends themselves can be constructed in different ways. Some hot ends are all metal. That allows them to work at much higher temperatures. On this screen, we see five 3D printers, two Prusa printers and three non-Prusa printers. Now there are many, many more options you could choose from, but the approach I'm going to take should help you to evaluate any combination of printers and decide what printer is right for you. Those cells that are in green, I view as an advantage for that printer, as a good thing. Now that's subjective. Everything I'm saying in this video is subjective. It's my opinion. But from my point of view, they're generally good things. Those things that are in red are not necessarily a disadvantage, but it's a feature that may be lacking, not as strong on the printer. Those items that are in blue are more or less a toss up. Now you'll see in the top row, we have the Prusa Mini. I do not own a Prusa Mini. So everything I'm saying about that printer is based on watching other people's videos and reading reviews on the web. A Prusa i3 MK3S. I own an original Prusa i3 MK3. The S model has some minor improvements to the filament sensor, to the hot end, a couple other minor improvements. Basically, they're the same overall printer. Next, an Ender 3 version 2, which is the most recent 3D printer I purchased. An ANET ET5. That printer was sent to me by ANET for review. And a Monoprice Ultimate 2 that was provided to me by Monoprice 
for review. Let's begin at the top, price. The Ender 3 version 2 is the lowest cost printer in this list. The Prusa i3 MK3S is the most expensive printer in this list, but that's not the whole story. Some of these printers are kits where you assemble them yourself, and some of these printers are fully assembled. Based on my experience with the Prusa i3 MK3, I would not recommend purchasing a Prusa printer, at least the i3 MK3, as a kit. Now, that was the first 3D printer I'd ever put together. But I'm sort of a handy guy, if I can say so myself. I do a lot of woodworking, construction, electronics. I always have. It took me almost six hours to assemble that printer, and it was painful. I think if you're not really handy, you're gonna spend a day or more trying to put that printer together. If I was to assemble that printer today, probably three to four hours, because I understand the components generically. One of the disadvantages of the Prusa i3 MK3 in particular is what they view as an advantage. It uses an extensive number of 3D printed components that allows them to change them a little bit, to offer upgrades easily, but it means you have many small components that have to be combined together when in some cases a traditionally manufactured metal component might be a better fit. On the other extreme, the ANET is a kit that's exceptionally easy to put together, under a half hour maybe under 20 minutes. In the middle, in terms of assembly, would be the Creality Ender 3 version 2. And that printer will take most people probably about an hour to put together. It's not difficult to put together, but there are a couple times where you would like to have a third hand. So maybe somebody helping you out could be helpful. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have the Monoprice Ultimate 2, which is a completely, fully assembled 3D printer built like a tank. It's also the only 3D printer in this list that is fully enclosed. In fact, you can see it behind me in the corner. Let's continue our analysis. Build volume. The ANET ET5 is the top of the line here. It has the largest build volume by far, and that's an advantage for that printer. And so the advantage in terms of space goes to the ANET printer. Next, control board. The computer that runs the firmware, it's called the control board or the controller in the printer. For a long time, the controllers in most 3D printers were 8-bit controllers. The disadvantage of that is there's less room, less memory space. Think of it as a smaller desk or a bigger desk. And so it's hard to squeeze more features into that printer. That said, Prusa has done an outstanding job of providing excellent firmware for the i3 MK3. So whereas a 32-bit board is an advantage, in the case of the MK3, it's not as much an advantage as you would expect. Next, extruder. We talked about Bowden tube versus direct. Direct extruder printers, in my opinion, are superior. So why do so many 3D printers use Bowden tubes? Because by not having the extruder right on top of the hot end, and the hot end is moving around, the structure of that hot end can be less robust. There'll be less vibration. The more weight you're moving around, the more work those stepper motors have to do. You can use lower end stepper motors and have a higher quality print experience if you have to move less weight around. But if you put the right quality stepper motors together, and you have the right physical structure 
I find a direct extruder printer is always better. Why? Number one, you're going to get less stringing. What does a extruder have to do with that? Well, in order to minimize stringing, slicers retract the filament when it's not printing. Now, when you retract your filament, you're not pulling it out of the nozzle. It's already melted in there. But you're reducing the pressure on that nozzle, and that will mean less filament will drip out and you'll have less stringing. Because of all the flexibility in a Bowden tube, a typical retraction in a Bowden tube printer is anywhere from four to eight millimeters of filament to pull enough back to reduce the pressure. In a typical direct extruder printer, it's one to two millimeters and it's more effective. So two things happen. It works better, it takes less time. You're re retracting less filament. Because you're retracting less filament, and because it takes less time, 3D printers, in my experience that are direct extruders, are dramatically faster. I find them to be about a third faster. So my Ultimate 2 and my Prusa i3 MK3 are the two fastest printers I own. Next, maximum extruder temperature. Well, if you're only printing in PLA, this doesn't matter. Most PETG can also be printed at 230 Celsius or lower. But if you want to print with more exotic filaments, temperature is going to really matter. The only printer I own that can print with really high-end filaments is the Prusa i3 MK3. Enclosure. The only printer I own in this list, because I own another printer from a company called Quiddy that's fully enclosed, that's fully enclosed is the Ultimate 2. Now, as I mentioned, having it fully enclosed does it, makes it a little bit quieter. It allows me to control the temperature inside very, very precisely because it's less impacted by outside temperatures. That means when printing with more exotic, higher temperature materials, that's an advantage. Unfortunately, the Ultimate 2 doesn't have an all-metal hot end, so I'm not printing that hot anyways. And when printing with low temperature materials like PLA, having a fully enclosed printer, I find is a disadvantage. Unless, I guess you have one that has fans in it, which the Ultimate 2 does not. Next, filament sensor. That's very simple. When you run out of filament, you'd like your printer to stop. And so the majority of these printers have a filament sensor. Print recovery. If you lose power or because of the filament sensor, your print stops, can you restart your printer? All of these printers listed here now support print recovery. Dual Z axis. The Z axis is the vertical axis. Now they all clearly have two rails that they're running on, but is there a stepper motor on each Z axis? Are they very precisely controlled or are they more or less cantilevered over in some way? The only two printers here that have a dual Z axis are the larger ANET ET5 and the Prusa i3 MK3. Advantage, dual axis. Auto bed leveling. All of these printers have auto bed leveling except for the Ender 3 version 2, but you can add it for about 50 bucks and a little bit of work to the Ender 3 version 2. Integrated software. The only company here that provides a truly integrated environment is Prusa. Prusa controls their hardware, their firmware, and their slicer. That is a significant advantage to Prusa, which is why in general, Prusa printers are easier to use. They're also updated continuously. The slicer is updated, the firmware is updated, it's all cap in sync. So while I hadn't used my Prusa i3 MK3 for a long time, when I went back to using it, I was once again delighted with both the performance and the quality you get from a Prusa i3 MK3. Now, quality is an interesting thing. You don't always need it. You know, there are automobiles that you can buy for 20, 25,000 US dollars. 
and there are automobiles you can buy for 60, 70, 80,000 US dollars, even much more. But depending what you're using your vehicle for, you may not need more quality. If you're going to fully finish, sand, seal, and paint your 3D prints, maybe quality is less important. So yes, my Prusa i3 MK3 produces by far the highest quality prints of any printer I own. But most of the time it doesn't matter. But quality, advantage, Prusa. So how does this all add up? Well, at the very top on this graph, you'll see the name of the printer with two symbols after it. So the Prusa Mini has six green boxes and it's a moderate priced printer. The MK3S has nine green boxes, the, the most of any printer here, but it's a very expensive printer. The Ender 3 has the least number of boxes, but it's a very inexpensive printer. The ANET ET5 is middle of the road, as is the Ultimate 2. So here's my take. If you want a printer, you can use right out of the box with the least amount of effort by a fully assembled Prusa printer. You can't go wrong. It's going to be more expensive, but if you're buying it to do a job, maybe that job is printing furniture for doll houses you manufacture or for a hobby. Maybe that job is, consists of something in crafts you do where you're really not into 3D printing. You just want it to work, buy a Prusa printer, pay the extra money. If you're a tinker and you like changing things around, you like modifying things, the idea of playing around with the printer itself is exciting to you, I love doing that, buy a Creality or an ANET printer from this list. There are many others that are also good that's on this list. If you want high speed, fully assembled at a lower cost, the Ultimate 2 is a very solid printer. Well, folks, I hope you learned something today, something you can apply to any 3D printer purchase. If you did, give me a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. If you wanna talk about this some more, go to forum.drvax.com. The Dr. Vax community discussion group, completely free. And you can post pictures of prints you've made, pictures of your modifications to your printers. You have discussions with um, close to a thousand just really nice and kind folks that are interested in discussing these topics together. Thanks so much. Let's continue to learn things together.